So um, I just added the little Google is your friend because Google comes up a lot in this discussion. Um, so before I jump into talking about some different strategies, I just want to briefly talk about my teaching experience here at UCSB since that's what I'm drawing on um, and these different strategies that I talk about. Um, I'll mention a few things to keep in mind as I'm going through this presentation. Um, and then thinking about some strategies specific to instructors of record who have a little bit more control over what's ap actually happening in the class. And then some strategies for teaching assistants that are also applicable for primary instructors. So for in my time here at UCSB, I've been a teaching assistant in my home department um, in linguistics, primarily for sociocultural linguistics classes. So these are looking at language, culture, and society, um, as well as a TA in the Department of Black Studies. Um, and I've been the instructor of record for our department's introductory linguistics course, but this was actually taught online as a hybrid with UCSB students and students at historically black colleges and universities. So this was part of a UC HBCU Pathways Initiative grant, so it was a little bit different. Um, as well as a dual enrollment course taught at um, Dos Pueblos High School, so this was like a language and society similar to a class we have here at UCSB. So this is what I'm drawing on and these kind of different strategies that I'm talking about. So a few things to keep in mind. Um, when I'm talking about student representation or students, want to, students wanting to see themselves in the class, this is not the same thing as students wanting to only learn about themselves. Um, this is students wanting to learn about the world and see themselves represented as part of that. Um, so sometimes those can be a little confused. Um, as a general kind of I don't know, word of caution or something that I worry about in my own teaching and kind of underlies a, little, a lot of what I talk about here um, is that no matter how well-intentioned, ill-informed attempts at inclusivity can very easily cross over into essentializing students' experiences and backgrounds. Um, so that's something that obviously we would hope to avoid. And I recognize that racially inclusive might not mean exactly the same thing to different people. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I mean by a racially inclusive classroom. So. For me, this means that all students, regardless of their ethno-racial background, see themselves represented or included in some way. So ideally, this would be in the curriculum, but the reality is we have 10 weeks, the class is on a specific topic, so that's probably not going to be possible. Um, but we can always welcome and validate students who bring in their cultural experiences and perspectives in their writing, in their assignments, in class discussions. Um, so even if it's not you know, written on the syllabus, that doesn't mean it doesn't have a place in class. Um, and crucially, Disrupting whiteness as the norm. Um, so whiteness in academic spaces is something that is talked about more or less depending on your discipline. Um, but this is something that's really important, especially for students of color. Um, so this focus on inclusivity is focused on students of color because those are who have been historically excluded and continue to be excluded. Um, so that doesn't mean that whiteness doesn't have a place in the class, but that we need to make room for all students to be represented. So the first strategy, I apologize, it's shifted down a little bit, um, is critical and collaborative curriculum construction. I was not going for alliteration when I came up with this title, but it just worked <laughs> out that way. Um, so this is more geared towards instructors of record, as I said, who have a little bit more control over what's actually going into the class. So what I mean by this is actually being reflexive and thinking about what you're putting into your curriculum, into your course. So actually asking yourself, okay, who am I including? Whose ideas are going in the syllabus? Why am I putting them in there as opposed to someone else? And what do I actually know about them besides this paper that I'm citing them for? Um, so you could think about if you're teaching a class now or there's a class you want to teach in the future, you know, have you made an effort to include the work of black, Latinx, Asian, or native scholars? Um, have you included the work of scholars from outside the US, particularly outside um, Western countries or you know, the global north, however you want to think about it? Because um, those are kind of doubly marginalized perspectives in a lot of classrooms. So if the answer to these questions would be no or I don't know, um, this is where that collaboration comes in. So as grad students, especially in humanities and social sciences, we have access to each other um, in different disciplines. Um, so we could talk to other instructors, look at their syllabi, ask questions. Um, we can ask our colleagues, we can ask faculty members, we can ask librarians, they're amazing resources. Um, and so this can be within your discipline or outside of your discipline and related disciplines. Um, but also as the primary instructor, it's our job to do our homework. Um, so most scholars have some sort of online presence. They have a department website, an academia page, um, you know, a personal website, they're on Twitter. You can find them somewhere and find out something about them. Um, we can actively search for scholars, ideally scholars of color in our own disciplines, um, but sometimes the reality is we have to go outside of our discipline to find people who really represent what we're trying to teach. Um, but also looking at 
reputable non-academic resources as a strategy. So if we think about the structural racial barriers that there are within the academy, if we're only looking within academia, we're already limiting whose perspectives and ideas can be represented in the class. So this kind of critical review um, or collaborative construction of the syllabus and the course curriculum is important because I think when you do that, then you're better able to actually acknowledge um, kind of who's been included and who's been excluded and talk with your students about that as much as possible. So talking about you know, who it is that you're learning from and explaining as much as possible why certain people aren't in that space. So you know, talking with your students about just you know, if there's someone that's in your syllabus that you're gonna be reading from, talking about who they are, what department they're in, um, you know, other work that they've done, maybe where they're from. Um, if your uh, syllabus is all white scholars, as much as you know, people don't wanna talk about race in the classroom, it's important that students are aware of disciplinary biases as much as grad students and faculty members are. Um, so don't think that just because they're undergrads they don't need to know kind of who they're learning from. Um, but also crucially when we talk about kind of who's not included in the course curriculum, we can make it clear to students that that might not be just an oversight or because their work is less important, but the reality again of a 10 week class on a single topic, you can't represent everyone all of the time. So, you know, just talking about kind of the politics of what goes into a classroom setting. Um, so some strategies that I'll be talking about just for the sake of time, I'm not going to read them here, but this is what I'll go through. Um, so one thing that I'm really big on is getting to know my students. Um, and when you do this, you can kind of let them do some of this work for you. Um, so what I like to do at the beginning of every class or section within that first week is have students do some sort of informational survey. Usually it's like a little note card, half sheet of paper, very informal. Um, you get the usual demographic information, but you can also ask them what they're interested in, what their hobbies are, favorite musicians, sports team, whatever it may be. And you can basically use this as a resource as you go through the class to draw on when you're thinking, okay, what's an example I can use that my students will be interested in? You already have this information right there. Um, if you want to be really specific, you could do something like asking your students to submit a media example that they think is going to be relevant to the class based on what they've seen in the syllabus. So this gets them thinking about what's going to happen in the class and they're already making connections to things outside of the classroom. And then again, they've already kind of done this work of giving you media examples that you could draw on as the class goes on. Um, you can also, you or if you're the instructor, you could have a TA or someone else do it. Um, things that come up in discussion, um, during section, uh, on gaucho space posts, keep track of things that students mention. If there are things that you don't already know, Google them, yay. Um, it's really easy. And if, especially if it's something that's online, you'll probably find it very quickly. So um, that's one simple strategy. Again, Google is your friend. Um, but for me, this is really important because if the examples that you're using in class are coming from the students themselves, you're already necessarily representing students' perspectives instead of trying to assume what they might be interested in, you know, based on their ethno-racial background or, you know, other things about them. And especially for students of color who, in a lot of spaces, people are like, oh, there's a black kid in my class, I'll play some hip-hop, because they probably like hip-hop. Maybe they don't like hip-hop. Um, so they get to kind of, you know, tell you about their culture and their experiences on their own terms, what they want of, you know, their own personality to be represented in that class. Um, I'm also really big on using media, as you could probably already guess. Um, so I like this because it could be related to course content, but if it's not, that's not an issue. You could use this as a space where you can bring in some of those voices and perspectives that aren't in the course curriculum itself. Um, so you know, if someone was like, oh, I was really hoping that we might read something from this poet or this author, you know find them giving a TED talk or you know, giving some sort of performance of their work. Or if it's a musician, just you know, play their song or their music video at the beginning of class. Um, it's a really simple way to kind of just bring that into this space. And again, if students are already providing that information for you, you know at least one student in the class is gonna be interested in what you're showing. Um, another good thing with videos is that you can show as well as or instead of telling. So I'm guessing most of us at some point have had to teach about something we don't have personal experience with. Um, so instead of us trying to speak about someone else's experience, we can have them talk about it or show it themselves. And we have access to so many different people's work through the internet that you know, there's a whole world out there that we can draw on instead of us trying to speak on behalf of someone else. Um, so just as an example, this is from one class where we were talking about different grammatical structures in African American English. They're features I don't have in my own speech, so instead of me like performing them in a way that would be obviously stilted and unnatural. Um, I showed a humorous video where someone was using this, so we got to see it and discuss it, but then they also got to listen to it um, and then, you know, bringing a little bit of humor into the class. Oh, there's no sound. Oh, well. Um, but it's just, if anyone's familiar with Vine, 
as just like a little video where they're interacting with each other. So yeah. Um, another strategy is swapping out classic examples. Every discipline has them. They're usually made up by an old white dude and they're really boring. Um, so you can just swap those out for more contemporary ones, just draw in popular culture. Um, so again, if you already have these ideas provided by your students, you know what they're interested in. Um, so this is one in linguistics, you know, we have different words to demonstrate different vowel sounds. So for this, I just took words thematically related to Black Panther. Um, so I did this lesson about a week after the film came out, so I like completely redid this whole lesson to make it related, and the students were really into it, and they had fun with it, they recognized the words. Um, so that just made it a little bit more engaging. And that's part of being flexible as an instructor, is like you might have your whole slides made up and realize, no one's really gonna be into this, they all seem to really like this movie or this performer or whatever. You know, being open to changing that based on student input is you know, validating, one, that you're listening to what your students say and that you value you know, their contributions to the class. Um, so with all that said, this is just showing that you know, when we talk about using technology in the classroom, it doesn't have to be really complicated and like, technologically advanced. Um, just being more intentional about the technology we already use um, as scholars. Um, and the resources that we have within academic spaces, which are things that, you know, especially at some place like UCSB and R1, um, so they're just really right at their fingertips. Um, so for anyone who is saying, oh, but I'm, I don't want to seem old, um, I don't want to be out of touch with my students, I don't want to seem weird, you know, again, if you're letting your students bring themselves as individuals into the classroom space, that's not really something you have to worry about as much. Thank you. So we have about two minutes if you have any questions for Kendra before we move on. You are talking about uh, including uh, like other races into the course and I'm from a STEM background and when you're teaching a science or maths course, how you could do the, how you could possibly do that in the course when you're not talking about when that's not the topic of the course. Mm -hmm. I mean, ideally in some classes you're talking about like people or populations usually in some way. Um, so um, I kind of think of it as like, if you use like word problems or examples that involve like this community has this, you know, whatever. Um, drawing on cult aspects of different cultures. Um, I always think of this example as someone saying something like, um, this is from like elementary school, but someone talking about how you know, the test questions were always talking about like making peanut butter and jelly and drinking a glass of milk for breakfast in the morning. And they were like, that's not what I did in my family. So like I didn't have that kind of connection to the content. Um, so you can still do the same kind of thing where, you know, you ask for information about your students and ask them what they're interested in. And instead of taking, you know, this would be kind of like a swapping out classic examples kind of strategy where um, sometimes it might involve getting creative with how you do it, but um, just being intentional about having the content actually reflect people that are in the class. Um, yeah, without experience in STEM, I don't know how labs go or you know, what kind of actual work you all do, but that would be my suggestion. Awesome, all right, thank you, Kendra. Yay. Thank you. <laughs>